And yeah, okay, so then we, we can start. It's a pleasure to have Professor Falkovich here, which is gonna tell us about the uh, broken and emerging scene that is in turbulent state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me start from a general remark. So we will define turbulence in a very general non-fluid mechanical way as just we take a system with many degrees of freedom deviated from equilibrium which means that's more or less general uh, definition. And of course, it could be in a solid state when you excite uh, quasi-particles, or it could be uh, any other state of a system. Uh, but uh, of course, quintessentially the uh, problems that we uh, started from, this was just a fluid turbulence, so I put this, uh, 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 so you imagine a box which you somehow steer, and the typical size of it would be uh, L, and the typical velocity with which you steer would be L. And so out of this, you can uh, get a dimensionless number um, uh, because you have actually uh, centimeters uh, and uh, seconds here. So there is a material parameter which is called viscosity. It's a diffusivity, it's a kinematic viscosity, it's a diffusivity of momentum. Uh, it has dimensionality centimeter squared per second. So you can create one dimensionless combination out of two uh, uh, dimensionalities and uh, three parameters, uh, which is called Reynolds number. And uh, generally when Reynolds number is very small, then you have a laminar flow. And when Reynolds number is very large, very, very large, and nobody really understands uh, uh, how large it must be in many situations. Uh, will have something what we call turbulence. So in this sense, the Reynolds number uh, has a, a meaning of the number, number of degrees of freedom which deviated from equilibrium are essentially proportional to the Reynolds number in some positive power uh, without going into much details. And here is a general review where you can find this kind of a, a little bit more general. But I'll focus on a more specific aspect. So now it's a, uh, at high Reynolds number, the state of a system will be very, very chaotic. It will be fluctuating. It could be some kind of a mean flow, like you drive a car and you leave behind uh, a flow, but in this flow, uh, there is a lot of fluctuation and we're interested in its statistics. So what we'll be talking about symmetries, there will be symmetries of the statistics. So if I would take uh, two points at the distance R and I measure velocity uh, difference, which I would call delta V, uh, at this, that would be a fluctuating quantity and its statistics would depend on uh, R. Uh, and now I may ask a different question which pertains to this statistical distribution. I may ask if it's time reversible. For example, if I make a movie of it and I'll screen this movie backwards, whether I would see the same statistics, which essentially means that the P of delta V at the same R is the same as P of minus delta V, because what happens when you uh, reverse uh, time is just you reverse all velocities. And notice that here we are talking about single time statistics. So I measure velocities at two point at the same time. I may ask whether it's isotropic uh, and I may ask whether it is uh, scale invariant. So uh, if indeed it's isotropic, then I may ask maybe it depends not on two quantities, delta V and R, but of some of the ratio uh, where R is in some power. So this is a kind of natural question that you ask even before you specify the system. And the answer would be surprisingly different for different turbulences. And uh, uh, it, start, it all started uh, 100 years ago, essentially, uh, from the idea of uh, the fact that if you really drive your car and leave behind turbulence, then eventually this turbulence must die. Uh, but the vortices that your car leaves behind, they have a Reynolds number huge, like 10 to 5. Uh, and which means that viscosity is practically irrelevant to them. So the idea was that the turbulence behind your car would create a cascade. It would produce smaller and smaller and smaller vortices. And it eventually it would produce such a small vortices that would uh, be uh, burning energy because viscosity would be relevant for them. If you try to put it into some uh, estimates, then you would say, again, if I measure velocity delta V at the distance R, that somehow uh, its square would be a measure of a kinetic energy, which is contained in a vortex of this size. So you have velocity difference, and essentially it gives me the velocity of a vortex with the size R. And the typical time of turnover of this vortex, I could estimate as R over delta V. 
uh, which means that if I would take uh, energy divided by time, that mo something which has a dimensionality and a physical uh, meaning of rate of energy per time, how much energy, of course, this is energy per, per unit gram. This is energy which is uh, centimeter square per second square. And so, uh, energy flux, uh, this is something which I would try to mentally associate with how much energy goes from large vortices to smaller vortices to smaller vortices. And at a given size of the vortices, this small, how much energy passes through it from its uh, origin at very large scale, when is your car size, and its destination at the viscous scale. It's, it's not even a theory. It's kind of a hand-waving dream. Uh, but if you take it uh, um, at the face value, you would say that this ratio at the left-hand side must be energy flux, and because energy is not dissipated until you reach your destination, then this flux must be constant. Since this flux is constant, then you get this relation that your cubic moment of velocity difference must be proportional to epsilon r. Uh, that was actually done by Kalmogorov, who then take an equation which describes the motion of a fluid. It's essentially a, a momentum conservation law. It tells you that the time derivative of your momentum is equal to forces which act on your fluid. It's a gradient of pressure imposed on it and the viscous friction which acts uh, on it. And if you take this equation and you assume that this is statistically fluctuating field with zero mean, uh, et, et cetera, and it's isotropic, then you can derive from here directly, analytically drive the uh, equation on the second, what we call structure function. So now S ends would be moments of this delta V. You see, I take V of R minus V at zero at time T. I make a scalar product, namely it's a longitudinal, it's a projection of velocity difference on this uh, direction. And I can derive this equation. This is a, a, it's called karman hovart equation. Uh, Karman actually, derive it uh, before Kolmogorov. Uh, Kolmogorov used it, and what he actually say, let's consider steady state, assuming it exists. Mathematicians are still working hard, trying to prove that the steady state exists in the limit of viscosity going to zero. It's a non-trivial exercise. So you uh, say that left side is zero. Then you look at the right point and say, but also let's assume that viscosity goes to zero. This is a non-trivial, simultaneously assuming that viscosity, which is a friction factor which provides for dissipation, goes to zero and statistics getting stationary. So if you neglect your uh, first term and your last one, then you get this relation between the third moment and epsilon dissipation rate, and it essentially uh, gives you this uh, relation, but now with a coefficient. So it is just derived this uh, cubic moment in terms of epsilon. And you can write it, for example, in this form. This u is a delta v. I Sorry, I kind of changed the notation. Now, what is interesting is that uh, we'll uh, soon see, now I just leave it without uh, uh, explanation, that energy can go uh, down scales, namely from large scales to small scales. And it's what happened in 3D behind your car. But in 2D, which I will a little bit later explain in more detail and explain why, because of there is an extra conservation law, the energy must go backwards. Which means that in this relation, epsilon could be both positive and negative, in a sense, because it shows the direction in which your energy passes through a given scale. And essentially, it tells you that, of course, your delta V or your U mean value is zero. On average, two points could be, you know, with the same probability approaching or or going away from each other because it's an incompressible fluid. But if you look at uh, uh, higher moments, this is a third moment, it is more sensitive to high values of, uh, of, of delta V. And it tells you that high values of delta V in 3D are mostly negative. So if you find two points in which there is a lot of energy here, then it's mostly in this direction, which we, it in, in, indeed corresponds to direct cascade. So if you have a, a lot of energy at a given vortex, it would rather give this energy to smaller vortices. This, it will be rather squeezed. And if you look at two dimension and you see higher energy, uh, relative energy, of course, I'm, I'm talking between two points, then these two points would rather be going away.
okay that's that's more or less the kinematic meaning of a cascade if you look from the viewpoint of fluid particles and uh, and some somewhat later with Sasha Zamolochka we derived a three-point counterpart of it we were actually using some kind of operator product expansion applied to this turbulent statistics and then we derived uh, what actually we can say about three-point uh, uh, probability uh, here is v1 v2 and v3 and again you can see the uh, difference between um, uh, uh, direct and inverse cascade and you see that the, your third moment scales linearly with the distance between two points and uh, then you naturally ask okay if i know that my third moment scales linearly can I now say that my probability distribution would be a function of a single <coughs> variable, which would be delta V divided by R in the power of one third. <coughs> <coughs> that would be scale invariance, and that would give me a scaling exponent, which is one third. Uh, experiment shows that it's not true. Uh, here are the probabilities, kind of schematically. If you look at probability distribution at relatively large scale, it is this broken line. It's kind of not very different from Gaussian. And as you go towards smaller and smaller scales, you see that it actually changes its shape. It does not rescale. It changes. It's it's different. The probability distribution of small scale fluctuation is qualitatively different from probability distribution of a large scale fluctuation. You can also see it computing moments. And this S n, which uh, let me remind you, delta v and the power n, they scale. All of them are power laws, but exponents aren't linear function of n. For n equal to three, of course, the exponent is unity. For n equal to zero, the exponent is zero. But if you look, for example, for n equal to two, which is the second moment, which if you Fourier transform it would give you uh, energy spectrum in Fourier space, it's not two short. And so its Fourier image is not five short. So many people heard about five short law of turbulence. It's not true. It's approximately true. It's not very far from five third, but it's not true. Uh, and so this is a still not resolved problem. What are actually numbers which stay on this line? How one can derive it at, uh, from the uh, Navier-Stokes or Euler equation? What they tell us? Uh, and uh, do they depend on anything? Are they universal numbers, the scaling exponents, uh, or not? And so, uh, is he yes, shown? Are, are those uh, results of Monte Carlo's or yeah, uh, simulations or yeah, this uh, is uh, they are both measured experimentally in high Reynolds number experiments uh, and uh, and, uh, and measured numerically in, in, in numerical experiment. You just do direct numerical simulation of Navier Stokes equation driven by force, it's done in three, four, and five dimensions. And so we know now how they depend on space dimensionality. Even uh, distribution. You can measure the probability distribution numerically as well, I guess, no? Yes, I can measure probability distribution, and I can, it, which is very difficult to, to work with, but uh, this uh, structure function, Sn and the scaling exponent, zeta n, we now know up to n equal to 10, confidently up to n equal to 12. Well, also, they uh, is a convex curve, and... Uh, they actually getting more convex as space dimensionality increases. So the deviation from linear line increase as you increase space dimensionality. So in this, in this uh, field theory, uh, limit D going to infinity is not a Gaussian limit. Uh, I can talk uh, separately about it, but just let me give this remark. But the, anyway, the, so... Universality and the, the... Universality is still very much argued. Uh, so far, I have not seen convincing uh, demonstration of non-universality. Okay. So the measured differences between these numbers are more or less within error bars, okay. as okay. far as I can see. Okay. And as statistics improves, they would rather tend to approach each other than deviate from each other. But uh, again, it's, it's an empirical data and the uh, jury is out in this sense. Okay. And, uh, uh, I used to have strong opinions on this matter, and I don't uh, have it now. It could be either way. Okay. So, but so, the experimental uh, uncertainty of, of different experiments, if you're, you're saying that they are within uh, error bars, right? 
But yeah. what about this um, Kolmogorov curve? Oh yeah, they're, they're, way, they're, they're far away uh, from Kolmogorov away. curve. Even here at low uh, numbers, which corresponds to uh, kind of uh, end like one, one quarter or one third. Even here, we know that the slope is not one third with, 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 with relatively high confidence. Mm -hmm. And as far as we go to n equal to six, it's so far away from uh, Kalmagorov. So if you just, uh, it, in terms of probability, it, it means that the probability of some large fluctuation is like uh, 500 times larger than, uh, than Kalmagorov distribution would, would predict, right? So it's really, I mean, because this scaling essentially tells you that uh, the, uh, you see, if, if you look at this blue, blue curve at the left, its difference is that it has a very fat tails. It has a high probability of, uh, of uh, large fluctuation. And then essentially means that the uh, moments, uh, higher moments uh, are much, much larger than the respective power of lower moments because mm -hmm. They are proportional to R in the smaller power, and R is a small parameter. R, it's, what is, stands here is R over L, uh, which is the size of the system. So if we're absolutely confident. I mean, 30 years ago, I, when I started in this field, I have my doubts because, you know, the scale environment was so beautiful. Uh, no doubt anymore. I mean, this data, I mean, really very convincing and very accurate. But the differences between different uh, uh, numerical simulations aren't that large, okay? And, uh, and, and sometimes they claim some differences and it could be real, but it's not enough. Uh, I don't have enough confidence to, to claim. People are working on it, okay? So now um, let me give you a, a, an uh, explanation, uh, one way of interpretation of these numbers, which we came uh, when we were studying passive scalar some uh, probably 20 years ago, but this is kind of a little bit more modern. So these numbers, zeta n, sorry, it now psi n here. So these numbers, which appears on this curve, uh, it could be interpreted in terms of stochastic integrals of motion. And um, it actually works like this. Let me ask, if I take u, velocity difference between points one and two, but now this points one and two, not points in space, they're fluid particles. Namely that at initially, if I would uh, average u one two squared, it would just give me second moment and second moment has this uh, psi two exponent. But now I can let this particle go this time. Okay, and as they go with time, on average, their difference would increase, but of course it's a fluctuating system. Sometimes it would decrease. On average, their velocity difference would uh, increase, but sometimes it would decrease. And, uh, and then I may average over many such pairs, all starting at the same distance and going through this evolution. And I may ask if I can find some function of the distance between them so that this I would be integral of motion not exact integral of motion in the dynamical sense, what is called martingale. So something which on average would not change. So if I, and then it's pretty straightforward to show that if you really uh, say that at time equal to zero, it's value r to the power of zeta t, and at time equal to infinity, it must forget its initial starting point, namely r. Then you would immediately find out that this f must be proportional to this r12 in the power minus zeta 2. So in a sense, this zeta two is something which tells you that if you take two fluid particles, each one has its velocity, you compute velocity difference. As particles go away, their distance increases, but correlation between their velocity decreases. So you may take this velocity difference and multiply it by distance in some power so that this increase of distance would compensate decrease of correlation. And of course it would depend on space dimensionality. It's about geometry. So in a sense, when we return back to this picture, we would say that, well, Kolmogorov cascade describes only third moment. The scaling exponents of all other moments are related to absolute, absolutely unrelated, related, but in a very indirect way, they're related to some kind of stochastic geometry. And uh, these numbers are scaling exponent of conservation laws. And we actually proved it for some 
uh, synthetic velocity field, which is called Kreikman model. This was kind of, there is a review of modern physics in 2001, uh, which we wrote, which is called particles and fields in fluid turbulence, where this picture of uh, stochastic integral of motion, or what we call zero modes, appear. Uh, and it explains why the scale invariance is broken, because the other moments are determined by, by, by their own uh, geometrical factors and not by a cascade which imposes the scaling of the third moment. Sorry, so, uh, sorry, Gregory, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, in, in perfect fluids, there are all these conservation laws that are related to Kelvin's theorem. How do those conservation laws impact this? Uh... Nobody has any idea. Nobody, has any, okay. That would be the most honest question. Okay. But in 2D, when your Kelvin theorem is getting much, yeah, much smaller yeah. because your vorticity is a scalar, there is something that we know, and I will talk about it in five minutes. Okay, okay. thank you. So uh, now if I kind of uh, uh, wrap what I talked before, that usual connection, it's conservation law gives you symmetry, symmetry gives you uh, conservation law, you violate one, you broke another. But in turbulence, you see that extra conservation laws of, of, of a different nature, of a, of a geometrical nature, actually break scale invariance. And of course, I, 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 was, I waited until you asked me about time reversibility. Of course, the fact that the third moment is not uh, zero means that uh, time reversibility is broken. So um, in this sense, we have two anomalies. One is called dissipative anomaly. It's a fact that the time reversibility is broken in the limit of viscosity going to zero. Actually, this is the first anomaly in physics. Kalmogorov uh, suggested it approximately 10 years before quantum anomalies. Uh, but it has the same nature, essentially. So uh, kind of you, you sacrifice momentum conservation law for fluid particle. Uh, you, you sacrifice energy conservation law because of momentum conservation law. Anyway, so we, we have this dissipative anomaly and we have anomalous scaling in the sense that our uh, scale invariance of statistic is broken because of this extra conservation law. And yet, uh, there is another energy cascade, as I already mentioned, and this is in 2D. So now let's talk about 2D. Uh, we can talk about Euler equation as something which transport vorticity, which is a curl of velocity. And in 2D, vorticity is a pseudo-scalar. Uh, so you can introduce stream function, uh, which is uh, related to vorticity. Here is, sorry, this A must be omega. It's already uh, uh, <laughs> the next. So you can think about it as uh, this equation is the transport of omega by velocity V. And velocity V is induced by omega by some kind of a bio savar law. You can generalize this. Uh, actually, uh, Arnold was probably the first who realized that this is a whole family and it's a beautiful mathematics behind it. But uh, recently people told me, actually not told me, showed me that Lagrange had in mind something very, very similar, like 200 years <laughs> before. Anyway, so let's consider a scalar field A, uh, which is transported. This is uh, so far no diffusion, no viscosity, just, just an ideal fluid mechanics. So I have a scalar field A transported by velocity. It's in 2D, so velocity is incompressible. It could be uh, ex expressed with upstream function. And stream function is related to this scalar uh, by something which has M as a parameter. It's like Coulomb law in different dimensionality. Right? So sometimes the field decreases like one over R, sometimes like one over R squared, sometimes it behaves logarithmically, depending whether you confine your streamlines in, in two dimensions, in, 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 in some flux tube or in three dimensions. Uh, but in fluid mechanics, it usually corresponds to different uh, kind of uh, a driving mechanism. For example, M equal to two is a usual uh, Navier-Stokes or earlier where this you have logarithm, but there is M equal to one, which corresponds to a non-uniformly heated fluid. It's actually uh, models of oceans uh, at some scales. It works very well, where your buoyancy and, 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 and rotation actually drives. And then there is M equal to minus two, for example, when your uh, M is, when your Laplace of Psi is actually uh, this. And this is called charni hasegawa mima model, and it's a fast rotating planets or strongly magnetized plasma. So physics give us many such types of uh, passive, of, of active, what we call active scalar, namely scalar field, 
transported by velocity, which itself is uh, uh, linearly related uh, by some uh, scale invariant relation to this color. So Euler equation is just one of them. They all two dimensions. It's it, it's it's very important. So now, uh, of course, uh, what uh, Arnold noticed is that they all are actually like Euler. It's like a, a solid body rotation, and these different models just have different uh, inertia, if you wish. But they all are just motion of a geodesic. So if you take an Euler top, it just rotate. Uh, you know, you fix some point and kind of uh, rotate around it. Flu Ideal hydrodynamics is infinite dimensional Euler top. It's the same Euler, by the way, derived <laughs> this equation and that equation. So generally, they have this kind of Z form, if you write it in Fourier representation. So you have this uh, C, which are uh, the, uh, the structure function is determined, and this alpha is the inertia, and inertia depends on M. So how is actually your inertia uh, is, uh, your kinetic energy, which is inertia, because you have geodesics uh, and the uh, factor which is minimized is an integral of kinetic energy. Okay, so, or or, or, or you, you move on the lines of constant uh, kinetic energy. That's more or less this family. And this family has a very interesting properties. Nobody yet understand it, but we happen to discover it. So now, because you have a, a conservation law of two types, you would rather consider forcing which acts not on the smallest scale, not at the largest scales, but in between. So if I would uh, assume that now I have this, and to have turbulence, I add some dissipation, and I add some kind of this dissipation, and uh, I have forcing. And this forcing has its uh, spectral density, which is kind of in between, at some intermediate numbers. Then I can actually show that this turbulence would correspond to double cascade picture. Namely, because I have integrals of motion which is related to kinetic energy and something which is related to this vorticity or which would be in the uh, uh, in earlier equation, just uh, Kelvin theorem, which tells you that every fluid particle conserves its vorticity. In particular, it conserves vorticity squared, which we call entropy. But in other uh, 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 equations of the family, they're just different, but there are always uh, at least two quadratic invariants quadratic with respect to a squared. And so it means that you must have two cascades because you cannot dissipate this and this both at a very large k or at a very small k. They have k in the power minus m, which means that if you dissipate a, a finite amount of this at a very low k, you would dissipate infinite amount of that. So it must go uh, uh, opposite way. And that's a kind of a hand-waving picture, what we call double cascade picture. And now we have uh, not only direct cascade, but also inverse cascade, cascade which goes to small wave numbers, and energy happened to be in earlier equation in two dimensions actually going to large scales. That what Anzager already noticed that uh, two-dimensional fluids like producing large vortices, and then they live kind of long life. You can indeed check that uh, this is the results of our numerics, which means that we did this is M, we, we did M equal to two. We actually did many points, you can find it here. And this is the scaling of the field A, which is circles. And this is the scaling of field Psi. And they all are according to this uh, cascade relation. So indeed, if you look at the second moment, it really looks like it has a scaling, which you would guess out of dimensional reasoning. So you would ask, okay, maybe it's even scale invariant. And the answer is yes. So here are the probability distribution. This is for Euler, for the Stokes equation. You don't distinguish them. There, there are three different colors corresponds to three different scales, uh, 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 each one divided by 10, and you don't see differences. And the same is here. You also have three different, uh, different distances, and the probability distribution seem to be scale invariant. It's an empirical fact. Uh, I tried to prove it for a pretty long time and I failed. So I don't know how to prove that it must be scale invariant, but it is. Uh, okay, then we get, uh, 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 you know, greedy and we ask, well, can we promote this scale invariance to conformal invariance? Namely, that if I have a statistics in some domain D and then I deform this domain into D prime, can I just kind of recompute my uh, uh, 
statistics in, in this direction. And of course, Polyakov uh, suggested it in 93, and I remember that I was very uh, unhappy about it, and I was very young, and the, but nobody in fluid mechanics kind of reacted, they were all scared. So I remember I, I wrote a comment that it could not be, it's just impossible because, well, I have arguments out of time, uh, reversibility and other things, but it actually took uh, many years, first of all, to prove, to show that it is impossible and then to find that it's possible. So uh, let, me, let me show you and uh, tell you the theory step by step. This is uh, event step by step. There's still no series. It's just, just empirics. As usual, I mean, you, you may argue with Polikov, but you listen when you, <laughs> what you say is you uh, back. Uh, so uh, first of all, what we computed with the Malochkov, this is, this, I guess, is, is, is probably unpublished. Uh, that um, uh, if Kolmogorov phenomenology is correct, then in 2D you can compute the third moment of uh, vorticity, three-point moment, right? Again, uh, assuming the operator product expansion, this is actually not a computation. It's, it's, it's a derivation in a sense, if it exists, it must have this form. And then Guido Buffetta uh, uh, in Italy computed it from direct numerical simulation. And it's more or less follows uh, the, uh, our prediction. And it, in a sense, uh, a desk knell for uh, conformal invariance, at least at its naive sense, because uh, your, at least vorticity or velocity or any uh, or stream function cannot be primary in this sense. A primary cannot have a, a triple moment of pseudo-scalar uh, non-zero, okay? Uh, yeah, we, we probably, I mean, I was so kind of uh, uh, bitter when I found it and I've shown it to Polakov that uh, at some point it just never published it. Uh, uh, Okay, but it's not the end of the story. And uh, uh, so you can say that if you really look at the bulk fields, uh, there still could be some ways out and Sasha tries to invent some kind of a condensates which would give this non-zero vorticity and some part of statistic would be uh, still conformal in variant. But we found this part which is conformal, maybe not all, we found part which is conformal in variant and it's very different. It's not a bulk field, it's, it's about lines. So uh, let me tell you that lines are very important in two-dimensional turbulence. For example, if you would be interested uh, in our atmosphere of lines between positive and negative vorticity, that would be very trains because the positive vorticity is uh, a cyclone and negative vorticity is anti-cyclone. That's where actually uh, pressure changes because when you do have an anti-cycle, it usually corresponds to a higher pressure. And when you have a cycle, it corresponds to lower pressure. And the boundaries between them, it's actually where the weather changes. So it's interesting. Uh, and, uh, and here I've just shown this is off California coast. You see this huge vortices. This is a cyclone and anti-cyclone. And they are actually weather determining parameters. Now, this is our numerics with uh, Buffetta, Celani, and Denis Bernard from Paris. Uh, where we, uh, this is really, back then it was state of the art. Now, of course, people in Japan can do uh, probably 100 times, uh, 10 times more. But this is really 10,000 squared. And what you, what, what is shown here are clusters of vorticity of the same sign. All positive vorticity is colored, all negative vorticity is black. It's actually as much black as colors, just your eye fools you. But we colored them differently to show uh, the boundaries. So single, uh, the connected cluster here is red. For example, another is, so you see how actually fractals are these uh, clusters. Here is the ratio between forcing and dissipation scale is about 5,000. So it's really, it's, it's back then it was, it was like three months on a, on a computer, uh, on a supercomputer running. And then we started to study the lines between positive and negative vorticity, the boundaries of these clusters. So here, is, this is a magnification. This is a, uh, the citation. This is our paper of 2006. So the red here is a, a zero vorticity line. Uh, it's not a simple line, namely it self-touches. So uh, uh, blue is uh, its envelope. It's a simple line which is done as, a, as an external envelope of it. But is this 
points where it touches green. It's not actually a set of, of, of points. It has a dimensionality which is three quarters. So what we did first, it all started because we had a hunch with Denis that let's look at it because I just, Christoph Gavetsky told me to, to learn SLE. I learned SLE and I look where, where to apply it. So it was kind of pure, pure guess. And, but of course, it, that Chilani and Buffetta did fantastic numerics. And the, here is a scaling. So you see that the uh, fractal dimensionality of the uh, line itself is 7 over 4 with a very good accuracy. A fractal dimensionality of external envelope is 4 over 3. They're all familiar numbers for many people. And this is 3 over 4. Uh, and of course, it immediately brings us, in this particular numbers bring us to percolation. So if you really uh, uh, define percolation, in this case, for example, I would have a boundary which would be white hexagons, uh, half of a line, uh, uh, black hexagons, another half of the line, and I start a line and every time it hits, uh, it, it randomly decides uh, which is the hexagon here, and if it hits the black one, it turns left, and if it hits the right one, it turns right. And so you get these black lines, and this black line is something which is in the limit, in the continuous limit, corresponds to what is called a percolation. Namely, if you take a random landscape with a delta correlated height and start filling it by water, that at some point there will be equal probability to sail and to walk uh, 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 ashore. And at this point, this uh, line would have a fractal dimension of 7 over 4. And in particular, we check that uh, the clusters, the probability of clusters as a function of their size and their boundary also follows what people knew from classical uh, percolation. But the data here are for I zero vorticity line in two dimensional uh, earlier turbulence. And uh, so now let me remind you, probably you know, uh, it, 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 my, my still work on it, but somehow physicists in last 10 years kind of less excited, but it's still, it's very excited since it's called Shramlovny revolution. And uh, they already got few Fields medals for it, uh, except Adet Shram who actually invented it. So what's the idea? It's the idea that you can actually encode a curve in a plane uh, by a, a map. And, and, and then eventually by the motion of a point of a line. This is, uh, uh, it was invented by Lovner, uh, a, a German, uh, who was Karl and then Charles when he, uh, he ran from Nazis to, to America. His idea was that if you, for example, take a half plane here, you start at this point, so you have a curve which you can parameterize as gamma as a function of tau, and tau is kind of your internal parameter. But instead, you can present this curve as following. You can say the uh, 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 half plane uh, without, uh, 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 with this uh, curve uh, considered as a, as a slot, uh, kind of, you, you kind of slice it out. So your half plane minus this curve could be mapped back into half plane by Riemann theorem. So in this case, this point would just map in some other point over here, and it is the position of this point which actually determines this curve. So you can consider this, it's a map of the half plane. This map of the half plane, of course, must be at infinity identity because it does not know about this curve when you look from infinity. And the question is how it actually expands around infinity. And so you call this parameter T and that would be T which parameterizes your curve and your, uh, uh, and your map. And it satisfies a, a universal equation which is completely determined by the position of this point. So in a sense, as this curve propagate in space, this point moves along the line. So the dependence of position of this point on the line encodes the shape of the curve. It's a very beautiful idea. Mathematicians used it many times in different directions. So you encode a shape by a straight motion on a line. And what Adet Schramm did eight years after, uh, actually we, we started here at Weizmann together. Uh, and um, he said, okay, what if this z of t is a, a Brownian walk? What if it's a random walk on a line? Then, of course, everything depends 
of its diffusivity. It's a dimensionless number kappa, which tells how fast actually you 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 diffuse on the line, and then you can kind of recognize it. There is a kappa equal to four, which is a boundary. So if you kappa four or larger, you it is not a simple curve. It touches itself again and again. If kappa larger than eight, it's just area filling. If kappa is less than four, it's a straight line. Moreover, what Adet Schramm proved is that it has a fractal dimension, which is this one. It has a very beautiful duality. If kappa is equal to zero, of course, your point stands on, on one point and your curve is a straight line. That's how it, it, it moves. There is a duality between kappa and, 14, and 16 over kappa. And in particular, this 7 over 4 and 4 over 3, they correspond to duality and they correspond to curve of which one is an envelope of another. Because if kappa is larger than 4, it's not a simple curve. If it's not a simple curve, it has an external envelope, or sometimes they call it hull. And this hull has a dimensionality which is related by this duality. And in particular, this number 7 over 4 and 4 over 3 is such a couple. And what also Adet Schramm proved that if your Brownian motion, if your line, if your motion on a line is Brownian motion, then your curve has a conformal invariant statistics. In a sense, I, 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 I remember a pure joy when, when I learned it because it, you know, I never understood conformal invariance probably the way that you understand it in terms of operators. Uh, but here it was in terms of a random walk, which is, you know, bread and butter fluid mechanics. Then I said, of course, because a, a Brownian walk forgets itself every step. That's why my curve is conformal invariant, because it kind of forgets its, its every step. It's locally invariant. It's, it's, it's local. It does not know how it was uh, in other parts. And in particular, this uh, magic number, 7 over 4 and 4 over 3, they correspond to kappa 6 and kappa 8 over 3. And as we know, percolation corresponds to field theory with the zero central charge. And, uh, and then we went uh, to actually prove the Schramm hypothesis, namely that if we take this uh, uh, unbelievably beautiful but pretty complicated red line, th so we took this red line, which is zero vorticity line in our computations, and we did step-by-step -step mapping it back into, so as we go along this line, we mapped it into the motion of a curve. So we did this uh, schramm lobner evolution. And then we studied the property of this zeta of t, and we have shown that it is uh, actually Brownian walk. So you see that it's, if you look at it, it's independent, then what you can actually uh, do is that you can destroy the correlation in your vorticity field, right? So you kind of can replace it with the vorticity field with the same uh, 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 spectrum, but without any correlations of higher orders, and immediately this property disappears. So this is a pink line. So you see pink lines, and they aren't uh, a diffusion. The diffusion is when it's constant. Uh, so we were, of course, naturally ecstatic. And then we did it for m equal to 1. This is a, what is called surface ge geostrophic point. You see that clusters look very different. And of course, all scaling exponents are different and it corresponds to very different uh, universality classes that correspond to a central charge equal to unity. Uh, and, uh, and then we study also the statistics of the angle as you go along the line. We actually kind of try to uh, leave not any stone unturned, but they all kind of pointed to the same thing that this is indeed schramm lobner revolution. It's a, it's a uh, conformally invariant curve and it's uh, statistics of, of the angle is Gaussian, etc. And uh, that, what is this? This is uh, m equal to one half. Again, you can see the same, the same, the same place. That the only thing that what we now found that if we would try to guess this kappa naively by looking at this scaling exponents of my fields uh, A and Psi, you remember that for different M's, uh, uh, we had this picture, where it is, yeah, this one. So by changing M, I would change the scaling of my uh, scalar field and scaling of stream function. And so I may try to 
assume that my kappa, which is a parameter, or my central charge, if you wish, uh, uh, which means my parameter of what is the conformal model, would be also linearly changes. This happened to be wrong. So here again is this uh, psi and my field as a function of m, and those are kappas, or if you wish, central charge. So this is my m equal to 2, it corresponds to kappa 6, and then there is this thing which gets stuck at kappa equal to 4, and this one is not on a straight line connecting it, etc. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of all empirical uh, findings of it, and it shows that there is, uh, you cannot predict the properties of your statistics just from the properties of your bulk field naively. It's, it's, it's related, but somehow in a, in a more sophisticated way. And in particularly, what uh, eventually I've got, I've got this, uh, this is, I guess, archive paper with Mosakio. Uh, we also did not publish it. Yeah, sorry, there is no references here, but it's, it's Mosakio and Falkevich archive some few years ago. Uh, and eventually I've uh, kind of uh, cooked some hand waving argument uh, why it's getting stuck here at m equal to one and in between m equal to one and m equal to minus one, uh, the uh, class of, uh, uh, of uh, lines, to which class, uh, uh, conformal class they belong does not change. It's related to the properties of the advecting velocity field because this is where your velocity field, uh, this is a scaling of your, of your velocity field. And uh, you may see that when m, closest one, it actually goes to negative, but velocity cannot have a negative scaling. So essentially it kind of gets frozen at the point equal to one, not a theory, just kind of a, a hand waving argument by which I just convinced myself, you know, to sleep at night because I could not sleep at night <laughs> until I understood this, this saturation. Uh, all this is uh, 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 just empirical findings. Then of course, you probably remember that for every inverse cascade, there is a direct cascade. N namely, in, in, in usual Euler equation, I have an inverse cascade of energy, namely V squared, and a direct cascade of omega squared, what we call entropy. And then you can go and check and find out that direct cascade is not scale invariant, even. Not even uh, 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 conformal, it's not even scale invariant, as well as a direct cascade of uh, energy in 3D. Uh, uh, incidentally, in any other dimensions, in four, five, six, we also have data, uh, they only direct cascade, no inverse cascade, and they all are, have anomalous scaling, they aren't scaling Y. Uh, again, there is no theory. The hand waving is that like you, you have a, a forcing at large scale, and when you direct cascade, you always kind of inside the forcing correlation scale, but those exponents aren't at least so far as we know, are dependent on forcing. Uh, there are some kind of arguments trying to say, yeah, there are some anomalous exponents, but they are hidden as subleading terms in the inverse cascade so that you see it's scale invariant, not because there are no uh, other exponents. For example, are there uh, stochastic conservation law in the inverse cascade? Yes, they are. We cannot compute them, but we know that they are there, that if I take two particles, uh, or oh, oh many particles, that they how scale. But we don't know how they scale. Maybe they all scale uh, the same uh, as, as, as uh, scale invariance suggests. I actually tried to prove that two particles in 2D would, would, would scale as Kolmogorov scaling would predict because 2D imposed some restriction, but I failed. I, I, I could not prove. Okay, so uh, uh, now just maybe a side remark that SLE is a very universal formalism. So whatever you do, if you aren't even doing turbulence, if you happen to come across some lines, just check them. It's very easy. Uh, there are already algorithms. You can download this algorithm for you know making this map and checking whether you occur with SLE. So of course, they all appear in all our critical models uh, in 2D because they, they do uh, uh, at criticality, they can formal invariance. Uh, so uh, in particular, then uh, people found it in nodal lines uh, in chaotic systems. So if you have a, 
a sufficiently chaotic system, uh, some kind of a complicated domain, and, and you look at sufficiently high uh, uh, I, uh, eigen function uh, of, of sufficiently high eigen value, you would see that the lines of zeros of this eigen function, where both real and imaginary part are zero, they also have SLE. Uh, Matt Gustings found it in speed glasses, and then some people studied the classical fractal object of course cost lines. And there are two types of, roughly speaking, two types of cost lines, uh, rocky cost lines and sandy cost lines. And rocky cost lines turn out to be conformally invariant. And again, nobody, maybe there is a theory now, I don't know, last time I've checked, there were no theories. So what I'm saying is that it's a, uh, I mean, the moment I see a curve, I immediately check if it's uh, belongs to SLE because you immediately get a lot of information. You know, this, uh, like Cardi formulas, you can predict the probability of this line going here and, and crossing your triangle this way or crossing your integral. There's just some simple hypergeometrical function which describes statistics. Um, so if we now will be interested in the complicated statistics of weather fronts in the Earth, we can predict them using a deeper geometric function, but so far nobody asked me to do such kind of predictions. Well, maybe <laughs> another 50 years. Anyway, so uh, let me conclude. I'm, I'm approaching the conclusion. So uh, first of all, turbulence is a far from equilibrium state, is accompanied by dissipation, and time reversibility is always broken. Uh, it's uh, a question is uh, whether it's always broken in, in, in terms of anomaly. Namely, that if you consider steady state turbulence in the limit of zero viscosity, then of course it must have a finite rate of dissipation. But it could be that reaching of such steady state takes infinite time. Uh, in particular, I believe that in uh, uh, energy cascade in 3D is established in a finite time, so it's a real anomaly. Namely, you take limit of viscosity going to zero, in a finite time, you get a state which continues up to infinite wave number and dissipate finite amount of energy. It could be that in 2D direct cascade, it's not so. Namely that your, as you decrease your viscosity, the time to reach, uh, it, it kind of decelerating as it goes towards large K. Again, uh, nobody proved. But as long as you have a steady state, time reversibility is always broken. And scale invariance is broken in all direct cascade, again, in a stationary state, or it's such that it's, it's a finite time. Uh, there is no proof. I, I have a feeling that there must be a way to show it in a general way. We don't have it. Inverse cascade empirically seems to be scale invariant. Again, it's up to the point where somebody found counterexample or really computed something with a huge resolution where we start seeing it. I personally believe that this is because the corrections uh, which has anomalous scaling are subleading in inverse cascade. And I don't, and I always believe that it's probably possible to prove and we didn't. So it's not proof. It's an empirical finding, inverse cascade seems to be scale invariant. Now, bulk fields in inverse cascade, at least in one of them in uh, earlier turbulence, bulk field, vorticity, velocity, stream function are not conformal in one. With our accuracy, which used to be 5% and it's now 3%, which is pretty good in turbulence numerics, is the lines of advected quantities are conformal in one and belong to SLA classes. I spent three years trying to derive it somehow from Navier's Stokes equation and I failed. Of course, there are many speculation phenomenological why it would be so, but again, unless you, I believe that what is really important is to show a direct connection. We are looking at a Navier Stokes or earlier equation or surface traffic geostrophic equation or, or magnetized plasma equation. I know in which conformal, why the central charge would be zero for zero vorticity lines, why? Uh, even without, you know, any specific derivation and kind of, you know, back then we were found that John Cardi was a referee and he was kind of very happy about it. And then we tried to find out some kind of possible ways to 
locally derive a, a equation of motion. Oh, you can derive it, just can't solve it, uh, of, of zero vorticity line and, and shows it statistically it would produce this. No, I mean, I cannot. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, this uh, another story which I will be not talking about this inverse cascade is something which is very strange thing, right? It's, it's kind of a self-organization. So out of small scale noise appear some larger and larger entities. And eventually you always hit your box size and you start creating this big vortex. And it, of course, destroys all symmetry and, and, and imposes its own, which is also very interesting, which we call condensation. And it's, um, uh, it's more or less what we're studying right now. So I guess, yeah, this is my book on fluid mechanics. There are some things, it's, it's a textbook, but there are some things I actually written here in this uh, in this book. So let me finish at this point uh, with this summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregory. Uh, so let's see, the, I think we already have a question by Boyarski, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, hello, uh, yeah, we, we talked with you some years ago about uh, chiral MHD, right? Uh, uh, MHD with chiral <coughs> magnetic effect taken into account. And there was a long story of inverse cascade there. Yeah. And we recently did simulations with uh, Igor uh, Rogachevsky and Axel Brandenburg. Yes, and simulations confirmed this inverse cascade. So it would be extremely interesting probably to study this system with your approach. Did, did you have any look at this chiral? MHD. Yeah, I've seen it some time ago, and again, because I have no idea what actually makes this conformal invariant. That my guess, because whatever inverse cascade we found before in the limit of large scale separation, it gives us conformal scale invariance and conformal invariance. But because I have no general argument about it, I can, you know. I cannot, but I, I would definitely check it and it's not very difficult. As long as you have running simulation, it's pretty straightforward to check scale invariance and then, and then uh, statistics of lines. It would be very interesting because that would also, you know, because there would never chirality here anywhere. So that would be very interesting to see how it would play out here. Okay, then I'll, I'll contact you about this. I'll be happy, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, may, may, may I ask a question? So going back to, to the classic problem of turbulence and the deviation from Kolmogoro. So what is the present viewpoint on attempts, like even going back to Kolmogoro 1961, and Obukov to try to take into account the fluctuations in dissipation to get a more accurate formula? All these attempts, well, what is your yeah. point? There are many, well, Tomogoro formula could not uh, be exact for the simple reason that it's just uh, a quadratic approximation. You take a straight line and you describe deviation by quadratic approximation. Yeah, because your so quadratic approximation eventually goes yeah. down. Yeah, it goes it's negative. It's kind, of, yeah, it's kind of idiotic. Uh, actually, when we did it for passive scalar, we, we did it perturbatively and in passive scalar actually getting a trivial at, at infinite dimensionality. There we also did this quadratic approximation and you see how it works. Now, uh, there are many empirical formulas uh, for which I uh, uh, ascribe price which is uh, identically zero. I'm not interested in, in phenomenological formulas, right? I, we were interested in a qualitative understanding. Sure, sure, I think sure. we have this qualitative understanding. What are those numbers about? Those numbers are about stochastic geometry. They must be dependent on space dimensionality. If they could be very special in 2D, that's why 2D is scale invariant. Again, it needs a mathematician or somebody with you know, visual imagination better than mine. But, so we understand them qualitatively. And if I'm interested in something that I'm interested in getting them directly, I still think that a uh, case of infinite dimensionality could be treatable. Uh, I believe that in infinite dimensionality, Navier stocks would be very much like Burgers. Namely, this curve would be like this. It would be like linear and then straight, like what is called bifractality. Because essentially in infinite dimensionality, you'll be always, almost having shocks. But it's very non-trivial to do perturbation theory with respect to a very non-Gaussian case, which would be this. And I tried it for a couple of years and it's 
it's probably doable, but uh, otherwise, phenomenology, I'm not interested because it tells me nothing. No, no, I understand. Yeah. But, but sorry, don't, don't you think that this uh, uh, more structural understanding would have in, somehow to take into account this addition, all the additional conservation laws associated with vorticity, I mean, Kelvin theorem in, in three dimensions or I, I mean, yeah, and, and, and can you can, can you tell us are there references for attempts in that direction or look uh, what what I, I I try to argue when I argue about this Lagrangian conservation law that they are very different conservation law from higher from Kelvin theorem and higher sure. powers of, sure, sure. of of vorticity right it's a totally different picture right this is this is Martin Gales of of you you call it, by the way, build it for usual diffusion in multidimensional space. Mm -hmm. They just have a trivial scaling. So, uh, what role play higher integral, namely non quadratic integrals of motion, like vorticity in the power of four or, or whatever, or helicity, for example, which is non sign definite? I don't know. And I never seen anything which could be physically convincing. They were all very convincing, but it does not mean that it's impossible. I don't. I personally don't understand the role of helicity and higher integrals in turbulence. I have no idea. Okay. And definitely something which is worse because it's very difficult to work with uh, uh, higher integrals of motion, but I can work with multi-particle configuration. That I can do. And this precisely what this slide, which is now, is, is, is what we were doing. So, but, but, but this would be related to a Martin Gales of, of, of evolution. Yeah, I understand. Because for, from the point of view that you, what, what you mentioned before, the, like the Arnold point of view of an compressible fluid as an infinite dimensional rigid body, these conservation laws are precisely what define this rigid body. Yes, absolutely. So, so it seems like... Could be that some smart discretization would help you know, we, we don't have lattice models for two, I mean, real lattice models, which we, uh, which we would, you know, try to, to, to solve it discreetly and then take a continuous limit, which would respect all right. this relation between, actually, Dennis think... Sullivan, there is a, 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 a very interesting mathematician in Stony Brook, Dennis Sullivan, who tries to actually build this kind of a discrete fluid mechanics. And uh, I'm trying to help him to extend again, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but you know, because our many things which are related to conformal invariance and all things, they actually follow from latest models, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. actually in two dimension, there is a, like we, we have been working on it, okay? There is a, a sort of discretization where you, you approximate the area preserving diff group with SUN, <clears throat> because the, 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 the area preserving algebra can be viewed as the SUN algebra when n goes to infinity. And yeah. then you can truncate. And there you get something promising. Yeah, I think that this, this would be interesting because it would be uh, taking the limit regularly. Right, right. OK. I see. Thank you. So can I ask a question of myself, actually? It's Somehow related, and something Sasha and I also wonder at the point. So generally, you know, you, you 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 read the literature and you find this large number of essentially assumptions that people make on the the probability distribution. Is there? And of course, most of them are built to fit the data on the scaling exponent. But is there any other observable that one can consider to see whether or not we can discard some proposal or not, or? Yeah, well, in this respect, you know, this, uh, you know, looking at the statistics of uh, zero vorticity line was already kind of a micro revolution <laughs> because it was kind of went beyond uh, uh, second moment, uh, which is spectra or third moment or 12th moment. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, nobody really seriously studied uh, different time correlation functions. Again, that for, uh, you know, normally people who come from a usual field theory, theoretical physics, it's, you used to work with equilibrium. Equilibrium is you have a close description in terms of, of single time uh, probability distribution. Here you can do it. 
And in terms of data and numerics, I think it's, this is unexplored. And this would probably uh, clear many wrong hypotheses. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a question. So, why are you saying that scale, there is no scale invariance? In scale direct invariance? cascade, there are no scale invariance in, in sense of the probability distribution uh, is not uh, a function of a single variable delta v divided by r in some power. So, different moments scales differently. You, you, yeah, you can call it multifractality if you wish. Yes, but what if I look at just my structure functions and if I find that for every structure function, my, it looks like R to the power zeta n, then that in a sense tells me that I can assign certain dimension to this operator, right? So it then it yeah, to the composite that then it becomes scale invariant, right? Yeah, in a sense you can, well, in this sense you can say this is just a, an infinite number of dimensions in your in your problem, yeah. It's not additive, it's not additive, but it is. And they aren't additive, but yeah. Yeah, so, but it doesn't have to be additive. Additive would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, right. Additive. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a matter of terminology. So for us, I mean, that's anomalous case, means that you actually uh, uh, violate the uh, assumption about the uh, uh, probability distribution of a, of, of, of a fluctuating quantity. But in terms of moments, you just have infinite number of dimensions and they are, as is shown on this slide, they are uh, scaling uh, laws of, conserva of, uh, of conservation law of two particles, three particles, four particles. They actually, all these numbers tell me, let's say num uh, number four, it tells me how fast my four point configuration forgets its initial shape. Okay, that's it. That's, that's basically the meaning of it. That would probably, I mean, qualitatively maybe is the best that we did is that we really, I mean, we found a model, like we have, we have our Isaac model where we can actually show on it. But essentially it's, it's just it's, uh, how fast n, n particle configuration forgets its shape. It gives you this dimensionality of your uh, uh, structure function. Mm -hmm. So, but in related question, what about, um, you were talking um, about longitudinal structure functions. What about transverse structure functions? Are Again, there are data which are uh, not convincing enough uh, that they could be different. Uh, the longitudinal and transversal numbers, I mean, if you take, the lo I mean, the third moment, they are the same. They could be recalculated one into, into another, but if you go to, higher moments then the longitudinal velocity difference and transversal velocity difference may have different scaling. I don't see why they must have the same scaling, but the, da but the data of numerics aren't completely convincing here. So, but you're saying that at the moment you, you believe that it should be the same? At the moment, I assume that they are the same because I have not seen uh, uh, proof uh, otherwise, but I don't have also uh, any uh, physical intuition why they should be the same. Okay, and, and also regarding um, universality, when people measure it experimentally, do they perform one and the same experiment <laughs> to no, measure no. this? They, they compare different experiments, that's the point. You wanna uh, uh, check universality with respect to the type of a forcing okay. or a geometry of you, right? So, uh, it, Kalmagorov used to believe that all turbulences are the same. I personally believe the turbulence in the pipe and turbulence in the box are very different, right? Uh, but then again, uh, not that I have shown it, uh, but usually people have some kind of a different type of forcing. For example, Eberhard Bodenschatz in Germany has a very beautiful forcing with many jets coming from different direction into a, a cube. And some other yes, uh, people have like, you know, what is called French washing machine, right? You know, things which is, uh, which are two things rotating oppositely. It's a very different forcing. At large scale, your flow is very different. It has very different anisotropy. And then you look at the small scales and you try to check whether the statistic at small scales is similar. So First of all, statistic at small scales is getting isotropic. It's, 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 there is isotropization. But the degree of isotropization, how it scales with all this, is how high a moment scale, a little bit different in different experiments, but with an error bars, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. So, but then why, why do you think that 
for different systems it should be the turbulence should be different if if there is no indication here i here i have I, I happen to believe that they must be the same for the different system because again for me they are stochastic integrals of motion they are about stochastic geometry not mm -hmm. the way how i force it large scales so but, i think that they are universal the scale and experiment universal. but mm -hmm. whether they are the same for uh, transversal and longitudinal i don't know because it's a different geometry yeah, sure. No, uh, I then misunderstood you. What you said. You said that the uh, turbulence in the pipe and in in a box, uh, from your perspective, is different. So why do you think that this is different? Yeah. Let me explain you. There are open flow and closed flow. So I believe that uh, closed flow uh, must be the same, uh, and open flow like a pipe. There are different flow. This is a flow which all must always uh, transport momentum to the wall. Because what turbulence does is, you know, the most interesting thing about pipe is, you know, your beating heart would tell you every second. It's how actually, what is the friction force when you drive it, okay? So this turbulence, apart from being turbulence and conveying spectral flux of energy towards small scales to burn it, it also must transport momentum to the wall to provide friction. And I suspect that interplay of these two processes can change the properties of turbulence even at small scales, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference between closed flow and open flows. So, but then if, if I measure my uh, exponents of the structure functions in closed and open flows, do you expect them to be different or not? Yeah, I expect them to be different. People who, who work with pipe uh, uh, try claim that they're different, but the data are very poor. It's extremely difficult to work with pipe at very high Reynolds number and to find a piece of it which is relatively isotropic, right? Mm -hmm. The pipe is, <laughs> is complicated. Yeah. Well, and there are no simulations for pipes? Oh, no, 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 no. That's, uh, that's, it's, it would take another 20 years to get uh, to that Reynolds number. There is a Princeton super pipe which has a Reynolds number, I mean, really 10 to seven, I mean, there are no computers that can do it yet. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm sorry for asking, going back to almost the same question. So for instance, there are these papers by say Levesque and- um, Shea Levesque, and, yeah. Yes, and, and others. They make some assumptions about this in, intermittency, right? And then they claim that they can feed the data. My question is, so how good do they feed the data? Can we rule out, rule it out with the data, or it's at this moment it's impossible? No, I think that at this moment, Shelley Vec, and there are some other modifications. There are like I don't know five or I don't know uh, uh, maybe seven, ten different models, and they are just like this. They you know like uh, they say, okay, let's imagine the turbulence consists of these entities. Then if I mix these entities with this proportion, I get this curve. If I mix in this proportion, I will get this curve. They usually have some fitting parameter and they very well fit the data. In terms of fitting data, most of them are good and I, I don't foresee a dramatically new better data that would disprove them. But I'm not interested in them. Just, I mean, no. I mean, no. They, don't, they don't tell me anything because turbulence is about dynamics. And not the way that I imagine that different things happen. So if you think that different things happen with this rate, go and compute it. I mean, compute an instant on, for example, which would give you a probability of this configuration, right? Do it, I mean, it's, it's difficult. You need to do pass integral in this, you know, Martin C. G. Rose pass integral, but then it's doable. I mean, we did it for some, for some things, right? And then it's okay, Here's, this is a probability of this configuration, of, of the, this extremely strong vortex line, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, just from fantasy, I don't think it would tell me anything. But it's my personal opinion. I mean, it's really, if you, for some reasons, need a presentation of data, they do give very good presentation of data. But they have fitting parameters. Okay, thanks. That's very good. That's very, that is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I, I intentionally spoke very personally, right? Because no, no, but we like the we like the, the direct. Yeah, you, this is what we want. This is what we want. Okay. And it's kind of it's easier to do on Zoom <laughs> for some <laughs> reason. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Andrei, you want to say something? Yeah, I I wanted I was about to ask a question. So maybe it's 
again reiterate? Could you please reiterate again about uh, universality? So if if I think about the data or not the data, but the uh, way I'm describing the turbulence, yeah, the probability distribution, uh, which features would you imagine being universal? Because we are talking about the scale and exponents. This is one thing. The other thing is, say, structure functions because they also include the, this CN, yeah, which you have. So exactly. These parameters are the yeah. next so, level. So, so what, what level I, the whole distribution function. So what I think is that CNs are uh, uh, non-universal. They depend on how you drive system at large scales. They're non-universal. What I believe mm -hmm. is that there are a uh, few classes of turbulences, not that every turbulence uh, for its own, not that every all turbulences belong to the same class. There may be several classes and uh, probably I, I believe that all closed flows, no matter how they forced on the boundaries or in the bulk, if they are really closed flows and they have some kind of a quasi isotropic configuration, would have the same zeta n's, these exponents. I could believe that as a class of flows like pipes, could have different sets of zeta of zeta ends. This is I'm in minority in this belief in, in uh, among turbulence people, right? Uh, so this is what 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 about universality? And this is mostly about direct cascade. Inverse cascades are much much more universal because you force them at small scales and you effectively average over the way as you force. And also the structure and of that's this when you. And the structure of the CN, uh, there, what type of universality? CNs are not universal. They depend on the way you force. Okay. You know, you can imagine that you go to a toilet once a day and you do this. But it's a huge pipe, right? You have a really big bowl, okay? So it's a huge Reynolds number. But statistics is very, very special, right? So you average over very, every event dies before the next appear. So there will be some things which would be having the same zeta n, but CNs would be very different from if you constantly, you know, having a DRA and, and doing all the time. So CNs are not universal. And then when you say that you would like to understand the, uh, what happens in turbulence, what, what would be uh, the picture uh, how you would characterize your understanding if someone gives you just scale and dimension probably it's not really understanding would, would, yeah would, well would you want to understand the probability you know in a sense in a sense um, uh, the uh, computing these numbers you know when i was like uh, 40 namely very young i believed that i someday i would compute zeta ends get a nobel prize and and then live happily ever after now i know that probably neither will happen and nor do i care much about uh, either of these events because these numbers by itself okay so there are numbers right they somehow express through uh, space dimensionality but there are some things which i'm qualitatively interested for example is it true that these zeta ends go to unity when uh, dimensionality goes to infinity are they a monotonically decreasing function of space dimensionality? Engineers don't give a shit about questions what happened in five dimensional turbulence. I do, because it's really, this is an interesting system which is getting more and more non Gaussian as you increase space dimensionality. This I find interesting, right? And also, I would be very much interested if somebody would tell me that, look, there is this scale invariance is broken in your direct cascade, but there is some sector, you know, like we found this zero vertice lines in 2D. But there is some sector where there are some beautiful symmetries exist. And you just don't know. We just don't know where to look, right? So this would be, I would be very happy. So I'm interested more in qualitative things than uh, in quantitative. Mm -hmm. But again, it's kind of my personal taste. I have one more not unrelated question. So in the, what do you think is the role of uh, using a question of motion or something similar to this uh, Harvard relation in getting uh, more conditions on higher uh, structure functions? Because it completely fixes the third moment. Yeah. Yeah? Whether one can uh, fish anything out by going to higher. Yeah, no, look, Polakov, uh, I, mean, he, I mean, he is a magician, right? So. He actually tried to do it uh, with burgers, which is a kind of a simpler model. And for, for this, you need to assume somehow, you need to resolve kind of an, an anomaly, right? Because they aren't close, right? 
when you go to hire. So you need somehow to, and he made a very kind of interesting assumption. And it happened to be wrong afterwards. I mean, Sinai have shown that the, in Burgess, just because Bur but Burgess is very special. But it does not mean that you cannot do it, but it's kind of a tricky thing because it's a many things that we do without thinking in field theory, they essentially, when you apply it to statistical physics, they equilibrium type six. There are some things which are, it's really, this is something, the fact that you broke time reversibility is important here, right? And, uh, or maybe it's when you go to some, maybe you find some quantities where it is not, right? So in a sense, what, when I ask myself, why the bulk vorticity in two-dimensional turbulence is not conformal invariant, but zero vorticity lines are scale invariant. One way I explain it to myself, it's not a scientific statement. It's kind of, I'm saying, I mean, look, if you would have zero vorticity, that would be a potential flow. It's trivial, right? And, and this zero vortice line is what is left of this triviality of this zero vorticity. So all turbulence happen with non-zero vorticity. Turbulence is about vorticity, right? The zero vorticity line, this is sector of my statistics where I found something which is essentially equilibrium property. Conformal invariance does not know about time. It's kind of, you know, thing. So turbulence has many things inside. And maybe what I'll try to, to show you is that there are many things for which people didn't even look. I'm now trying to look at it from the viewpoint of information theory, trying to compute, you know, a, a mutual information between different quantities, et cetera. We just will have a PRL in, 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 in maybe a month or two, uh, it's a second round of referring. So, so I'm trying to, to look at it from different things like, like entanglement entropy between different things, how I would define it and how I would compute it. And again, people did not do it with turbulence, okay? Yeah, we have archive paper on, but it's about wave turbulence, about this information theory approach. I'm, I'm sorry. So um, I think I'm missing something. It, it seems to me that we, you've been discussing just the uh, statistics, right? Uh, so something that is already stationary. So why are you yeah. saying that, that uh, time is important here? So if I, if I start... Look, My time is important because you look at third moment and third moment is non-zero, right? So it's, it, it's about statistics. It's about single time statistics. But in this single time statistics, you have odd moments of something which is changes sign upon time reversibility, which is velocity. So you know about the fact that you have epsilon. Look, this is epsilon. Epsilon mm -hmm. is a dissipation rate, right? It's something which is explicitly builds in time reversibility into your statistics into single time statistics. Okay, uh, look, that I understand, but I thought that it can be somehow related to just very short or very long distances, right? Where we indeed see that something happens, that I'm uh, something, somebody is shaking the system or where you already see the dissipation processes. But if, if I'm in the inertial range, it seems to me that I'm, that I do not know anything about, about time. Look, this S3, you measure it in inertial range. You don't look at large scales. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, physical, uh, Physics Today review, which we wrote with Srini, we exactly gave this argument. You look at a very small part of your flow. You don't know where is the box size. You also have a finite resolution. You don't see viscous vortices at all, okay? So you mm -hmm. have a movie. And then you look at this movie and you compute delta V cube. Mm -hmm. Then you take this movie and screen it back and you compute delta V cube and it would be minus the yeah. fact, the thing that you compute. So by looking at it, you would know which movie is correct. Mm -hmm. Looking only in the inertial interval, no large scales, no viscous scales. Okay? okay. Because velocity is about time. You change time direction, you change side, side of velocity or vorticity, right? This yeah. just, yeah. It's not your spins, right? This something which has seconds in its dimensionality, right? No, but the, the fact that time reversal is discrete symmetry is broken by the presence of this flow. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, so why is this? So it, it, it's still a stationary process. Oh, it's stationary statistics, that's true. Yes. But on the other hand, if you try to describe it 
consistently, you could not describe it by a single time statistics like you would do it in equilibrium. You need some kind of a Kelbish or Martin C. G. Rowe's formalism, which would be which would include ta different time correlation of functions. There is no close description of non-equilibrium. No, no, yes. Right. Okay. So that's even precisely the, what, in the yeah, end, that, compute, in the end, you compute single time correlation of functions. So okay. So you compute these functions. They still have this epsilons built uh, here and there. I find that what is somewhat unique of this system of turbulence with respect to many things we are used to think is that when you have this, this cascade, the ordinal, the, the direct cascade, is that in, in a sense you have the infrared determining the ultraviolet. What normally, which is, a, a, again, when we think of smaller things determining bigger and bigger and bigger, here it goes the other way around. That's inverse cascade. That's why inverse cascade is more like equilibrium. Well, I, I hate to say it, it also has third moment, it has a flux and cascade, but it's some kind of really that you go from small scale and it's getting more and more universal. And, sure, and, sure. Yeah. Here's the other but it's right. hand waving, it's, it's nothing. Sure, sure, I understand. Okay, guys. I think Ricardo meant something different. No, I, so I, I wanted to say that the ordinary turbulence, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going from large scale to small scales, which is not the ordinary thing. We are it goes against our desire. Yeah. That's true. Because you have you, you have modes that can be excited at very short distances with very little, with very long wavelengths that become short wave. This is not what, what we are familiar with in field theory, right? And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank yeah, you. it was a pleasure. Okay, and you're welcome to ask questions by. Oh, we will. Uh, we, we will try to. We will try to bother you. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. you. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye, bye guys.